Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining. Looks like we're getting a pretty good uh, group of folks. So let's let's. Um, I I'm going to start, and uh, and we can just get some of the housekeeping out of the way in the beginning. So thank you to everyone for joining this evening. Uh, appreciate your time, uh, and hope everyone had a nice New Year since we took off uh, December. So that was a nice break for, for the COAT group. Uh, you, as you see on the screen, uh, we have our next talk coming up for uh, BSA COAT group is going to be a presentation by the MASS group. Um, and for those of you who haven't heard, uh, you're not keeping up their BSA news or your AIA news very well. The MASS group is uh, the 2022 uh, AIA firm award winner, and they're going to be talking with us on our environmental justice in a presentation called uh, Seeking Abundance and uh, their work in Rwanda and around the United States and uh, around the world uh, it should be a really exciting talk. And so we hope that everyone will come back uh, next, next month, uh, this, uh, February 16th. And we're going to be at 5 p.m. that night instead of 6 uh, just to accommodate schedules a little bit more. But Tonight, uh, we are having a lovely discussion about tools for sustainability. Uh, Beth and I, uh, my co-chair, Beth Percy, who may speak later, but is, has, uh, is a bit under the weather, and so her voice is a bit rough. So um, I'll, I'll speak enough for both of us, I'm sure. Uh, we are very excited about tonight's talk. Uh, one of the, the, the things we wanted to do when we became co-chairs is to have more of the toolbox talks. Our, our previous uh, co-chairs for the COAT group had started these toolbox talks that are great ways for us all to share the knowledge that we have and are using in our firms and how do we share that out and make this a much more uh, community resource. So tonight uh, we will have uh, three folks speaking. Um, we are going to have uh, Autumn Waldron is going to talk with us uh, about Tally. Autumn is with Arrow Street in their school's studio, and she is uh, very excited about energy and uh, energy integration and analysis and how do you make projects more sustainable using these tools. So thank you, Autumn, for, for being part. Um, we also have um, Jacob Savona, who is with the Green Engineer. Hi, Jacob. Thanks for uh, joining. You're making us a little nervous, not showing up. Uh, here. But uh, and thanks. Uh, he is a sustainability consultant uh, with the Green Engineer, and he works uh, on all sorts of lead certification, the new construction, offices, labs, schools, commercial interiors, and corn shell buildings. And he also uh, runs and produces the building life cycle uh, assessments using Athena, um, Athena Impact Estimator. So he will talk with us further about that. And then to you know, change flavor a little bit and maybe not look at uh, embodied carbon, uh, we are having Huan Ting Chang from Alcos Manfredi, and he is the sustain one of their sustainability analysts. He's a graduate from the GSD's Energy and Environment program, so that allows him to specialize in both architectural design and the building performance analysis, which is amazing and something I wish I uh, was able to have taken in school as well. Um, and he assists uh, Elkis and then Freddie um, with their design development and how they achieve their higher sustainable goals and uh, able to design to guide those design teams with this uh, simulation tools. So uh, he's also developed computational design tools that will support uh, lead and well documentation. So, so we're very excited uh, for that talk as well. So. Um, with all that said, uh, as I noted, we are 
we are recording. I know I've said it a few times, just want to let everyone know. And uh, we will hand it over to Autumn, I think. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. All right. So Jacob and I both have tools that are related to embodied carbon. So we just wanted to start off with a little bit of an overview about what embodied carbon is. Um, so we're all familiar with the concept of operational energy and the emissions that that produces being operational carbon represented by this little black piece here. But embodied carbon is really about all of these other pieces here and all the materials that go into the building. Embodied carbon represents the carbon emissions associated with every stage for the building materials, including operations. So extraction, transportation, and how you, produce, you know, refine that material. Um, and most of that material is there on day one when the building opens, but it does also include disposal after the building. Um, can you guys see the people on the side of my screen? Is that distracting? No, you can't see it. That's just me. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so Jacob is just going to talk a little bit about how we determine embodied carbon and how we measure it. Yeah, so um, like was like I was saying about the, the graphic on the side here. So the graphic on the side really um, helps you sort of visualize how embodied carbon is determined. Um, so it's determined uh, by using uh, a tool that you're both using, the life, life cycle assessment tool, um, but these are specifically for products. Um, and so in this, you analyze, you know, uh, the carbon produced at each step of uh, a product's uh, life cycle. Um, so starting with extraction of the raw materials that go into the product, that transportation to the manufacturing site, um, then, you know, the carbon that's produced by manufacturing that specific product, um, transportation of that product to the project site, the, you know, the carbon it takes to build um, that product onto, onto the site. And then of course, um, any sort of embodied carbon that comes from you know, operating that uh, particular product uh, on site as well. Um, so like I said, the, the tool that we use to determine embodied carbon is a life cycle assessment tool. Um, and what you all might see commonly on your projects that show embodied carbon in products um, that, and that use life cycle assessment tools are uh, EPDs. Um, and I think if we mainly sort of look at maybe just the, the front part of the EPD, but it has a whole bunch of information. Um, and if you sort of scroll to the end, uh, it'll show a graph um, or, or a table showing, um, you know, the, the life cycle assessment of that excuse me, particular product. Um, and I'll show you different sort of um, impact categories. One would be um, embodied carbon and there might be other uh, environmental impact categories as well. So why are we talking about embodied carbon now? Um, the 2019 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or the IPCC as it's often shortened to issued a report that indicated if we don't drastically reduce carbon emissions by 2030, there's gonna be a high chance that we're not gonna to keep to the Paris Climate Agreement, which is keeping global warming under 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, obviously the building sector has a hard, large portion of global emissions. It's, uh, and a large portion of our building sector is these materials and the embodied carbon. So we need to hit a 65% reduction by 2030 in, a net zero carbon emissions by 2040 in order to keep a 76% chance of not exceeding the Paris climate change. With this being peak emissions in 2020, here we are in 2022 knowing that 2021 had higher emissions in 2020, so we're already not going down the right path that we need to be going down. Um, but this is a very critical piece because as we reduce the operational, the embodied carbon is going to become more important as Jacob's going to talk. Yeah, so like Adam was saying, um, the operational cost of, of a building in terms of carbon, um, I think is something that's talked about a lot. 
and is sort of at the forefront of everybody's mind is like, how do we reduce our operational cost of a building? And I think owners of buildings um, are also looking at, you know, how do we become, you know, net zero uh, in terms of carbon? And they usually think of like operational costs. How does my, how does my building use less, less carbon? So as that's becoming more focused and that's, you know, that operational cost is being driven down, what we also need to turn attention to is like what Adam was saying is a part, a portion of the carbon um, in the building uh, is your embodied carbon that is that's in the materials and products that you select um, and choose uh, to build with. Um, so what the graph basically on, on the right is is trying to show is you know as our operational costs go down and the embodied and then the carbon that's produced through operating the building go down, then the chunk of the pie in terms of embodied carbon in terms of the materials and products that we use that's that becomes larger and larger um, unless of course you know the embodied carbon the building is also reduced and these types of conversations help people um, start to focus on the, the products and materials that we use. So one of the tools that helps us look at uh, the life cycle assessment of a building um, and, a, and a tool that we use at the Green Engineer and that I use um, is, an, is called the Athena Impact Estimator Tool for Buildings. Um, so what's great about this tool is that it's a free software so it's completely accessible to anybody um, so I, if you are absolutely interested in this i would encourage you to download it um, which, I, which i will go over um, in, a second, in the next slides yeah um, so like i said you know it's a, it's a free software you can um, if you go to calculate lca.com click on the software tab create a free account like i did um, and then it walks you through how to download uh, the software and for Mac users, um, because it's not straightforward, I use it on Windows, um, but you know they have a, a service that lets you download it uh, at no cost and you just have to contact them. Um, what I didn't point out in the site also is that they have really helpful tutorials about how to you know use the software and how to run an LCA. Um, I've I've used those as well just because uh, like you'll like you'll see and like I'll I'll show you is you know there's a lot of rabbit holes that you can go down when you're conducting a whole building LCA. Um, so it's, it's really helpful that they uh, include these tutorials uh, for you. Um, but since this is a free software, it is limited to what it can do. So it does make a lot of assumptions for you. Um, and it already has sort of this preloaded uh, database of uh, materials um, with their uh, EPDs that uh, this organization or company uh, gathers um, and inputs into the software itself. Um, so, uh, if you want to go to the next slide, please. Perfect. So, after you download the software, you can now start running whole building LCAs and start putting together, you know, projects and um, models uh, that you that you need. So these aren't you know typical Revit models. You're not going to see a whole building pop up when you you know start creating models, but um, instead you're sort of just in creating assemblies for the building and inserting um, material quantities uh, per assembly and per product uh, and per material. Um, so when you first get uh, the software open, you can now create a project. So this is the project that I have as an example. So you got your project name, your location, project type, life expectancy, the life expectancy in our case is um, almost always 60 years. And then you get your building height, uh, gross floor area as well. So now you have your parameters for your building um, for the software to base um, you know, the, the calculations on. So after that, go to the right first, or no, sorry, the left, the first uh, red block that I have, you can start inputting uh, different assemblies for the buildings. Um, and again, like I said, this software creates um, assumptions for you for these different types of assemblies. So there's all these assemblies. I usually go from the ground up, um, but it, it tends to just um, organize them, I think alphabetically it looks like. Um, but you can do your foundations, you know, your floors, columns and beams, walls, and then, and then your roof uh, assemblies as well for your building. Um, so if I break that out, you go to the big red box to the right, um, you'll see that each of these assemblies um, I've chosen for this example to show uh, how many tons of global warming potential, which 
in our case is carbon, CO2. Um, these different assemblies um, contribute to. So you can see that you know the foundations for this project contribute the most uh, in terms of tons of CO2, right? Because foundations are usually made up of concrete, so that includes a lot of body carbon, um, typically. And then, um, so what's helpful about this graph or this this table over here is that it, it it's showing you if I, if you want to target a specific assembly, you know which assembly has the biggest impact if you're going to try and attempt to reduce. Um, embody carbon. Um, and then as an example right below it is you can also look at it as percentages if you want to. Um, the software also, you can also change your impact category if you so choose, but most of us are looking at carbon anyways. I don't know. Are, are, we, are we saving Q and A's until after our presentation? So I'm just seeing, Sometimes a question comes in. So, um, if you'd like to address as we go, you're you're welcome to. Um, but you the, you know, it's however you feel most comfortable. Or we can save them um, to the end, you know, to a pause after your after your and Autumn's talk. Yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll we'll address them after me and Autumn finish our finish our rundown. In case in case we get we answer them as we go. Um. So now you have a complete model. You have your, you have your whole building LCA model ready to go. You're ready to conduct, um, you know, your your life cycle assessment of of your of your project. Um, in this case, you know, we I have a proposed case which I label as PC and a, and a baseline case um, which I label as BC. So the proposed case is just your design. Um, I think from what I see mostly is a lot of projects. Just you know, just want to do a run a, a life cycle assessment if they're designed uh, as designed a building, um, and not really base it and compare it to anything. But in our case, um, we usually do run um, comparison models, so you'll need a baseline case or post case. Um, so once you do that, you can go to reports, run your, you can uh, show your comparison report by system. For my case, I do lead, um, so I do show reports, and then on the right, you can see um, it spits out this nice um, table, this nice graph showing you compare it, comparing um, the baseline case and the proposed case uh, to the building. And then right below it is that table showing um, the different, uh, the different uh, totals uh, your impact has per uh, impact category. Um, you know, and of course, highlighting the global warming potential for carbon for this particular building. And then all the way to the right of that on that table is your percent difference between your post case and your design case. Um, I will highlight this building later on and you know talk to these reductions. Um, but if you don't do a comparison graph and you're just trying to look at the whole building life cycle assessment of your building, um, it won't do it, it won't spit out this comparison graph that it's showing, but it will um, it will still show you just sort of one, you know, one line in, in the graph and then one column in your table, basically just, just showing you your totals for that particular building. Um, and again, you know, basically telling you what your total life cycle impact is uh, for your design project. Do you want to move on? Perfect. So, like I said, you know, in, our, in, in my case, in the case of the firm, at the Green Engineer, all of the life cycle assessments that we do currently um, are to achieve lead points. So I just wanted to go over uh, what you know what the requirements are for lead um, with life cycle assessments. So this the life cycle assessment applies to the building life cycle life cycle impact reduction credit um, and the material and resources credits. Um, and we are now going towards the lead B version four four point one. Uh, version of this um, because it now sort of breaks out uh, different types of um, uh, different paths you can go towards basically to achieve different levels of points. So we do option four, the whole building life cycle assessment. Um, so for one point, um, all you have to do is just conduct a life cycle assessment of your building. You don't even have to show any sort of reduction. Um, and this is just really to get people to actually, you know, conduct life cycle assessments of your building and to show 
you know, uh, designers and owners, what your, you know, what your impact is if you're building based on the materials that you choose. Um, and then two points, and this is what we're talking about, like how do we compare it, a building to a baseline. Um, so 5% reduction compared to the six impact categories. Uh, one of the impact categories always has to be uh, global warming potential or carbon. And then for three points is greater than 10% reduction. And then four points is greater than 10% reduction in three of the six impact categories. And also greater than 20% uh, reduction in carbon. Um, what's also not shown here is um, you also have to do include some sort of material reuse. Um, so this one is usually difficult to achieve uh, on projects just because not a lot of projects these days have a lot of material reuse. Um, so we tend to see projects achieving points one through three. Um, so what's included in the scope of an LCA? So this is, you know, it's only the structure and envelope of the building. Um, you don't have to include any of the HVAC systems, electrical equipment or plumbing, any excavation or site work, or any of the operational energy use. Again, we're just talking about the embodied carbon and materials that you're choosing uh, for the building. What is optional and that we see sometimes on projects is including interior non-structural elements. So, uh, you know, interior walls, acoustical panels, carpets, um, if those are any sort of different uh, from the, uh, some, some sort of baseline product that could be identified by the design team. Um, we do sometimes include those, but not always, and it's just optional. Um, so the LCA boundaries, like what's included in terms of the LCA. So in that first, very first graph, you saw, you know, products going through manufacturer to um, end of life. And then even beyond that, right, is phase D is, you know, what happens after the project gets, you know, demolished and then, you know, recycled. Um, but we're looking just for, you know, phases A through C, which is, you know, product, you know, manufacturing, transportation, uh, construction, and then use is, you know, uh, replacement manufacturing, replacement transport, and then C is end of life. And so that's the construction, demolition, um, waste processing, and then transport. Um, but doesn't include, you know, that, that kind of um, recycle that might be able to happen to some products. Uh, on next slide. So the project that we conducted on, that we conducted uh, a whole building LCA for, uh, was our Brockton DUA project um, in Brockton, Massachusetts. But yes. Um, so this is a lead before a new construction project that is currently attempting uh, gold certification. Um, the reason I brought this one up and I found it to be the most interesting was that it actually includes some timber frame construction in the building. Um, and of course, if you can guess, timber does include less carbon, uh, you know, than uh, the typical steel beams uh, and concrete uh, floors. Uh, that may be included. So this project included glue lamb columns and beams as opposed to you know hollow metal steel columns uh, and wide flange uh, steel beams um, as well as CLT floors uh, in place of metal deck and cement floors. Uh, not completely th throughout the project but through a very large percentage I think over 20 percent. So um, that was great. Um, and then the last thing that we see common through most projects is they replaced um, some of their um, concrete mix with 25% uh, fly ash content. Um, instead of a baseline of 8% fly ash content and 40% slag, uh, which is what we see in sort of the Northeast region uh, of the US. So the results, which you saw in, the, in um, one of the other slides um, was a greater than 20% uh, reduction in global warming potential or carbon. Um, and then four other impact reduction, four other impact um, reduction categories showing over 20%, uh, over 10%, sorry, reduction. Um, then one thing I wanted to call out was um, the stratospheric ozone depletion only decreased by 1.83%, um, which was interesting and sort of a lesson that we learned on the project was, um, you know, compared to steel and concrete, um, engineered timber does include a lot of uh, adhesives in the process. So you might 
be wondering why do all these other impact categories increase, you know, decrease by 10% and this one's only 1.8%. It's because their um, the adhesives or glues that they use in the process actually contributes uh, a good amount to stratospheric ozone depletion, so CFCs, what's off-gassing during that process of um, manufacturing uh, engineered timber. Uh, so I think that, that, that is the end of my slides, uh, I believe. Um, so that's just an introduction to the Athena software and would highly recommend since it's free just to download it and just mess around um, and see what you can do um, in front of your buildings. Thank you, Jake. Um, so uh, I'm just going to take a step back and discuss how AeroStreet um, captures embodied carbon in our design process before I jump into Tally. Um, so similar to how we address um, embodied carbon, we take a very similar approach to operational carbon. We take a very similar approach to embodied carbon. Um, we first start with looking at the big picture, optimizing the form and the structure to uh, make an efficient building and design from the start. Similarly with how you start with operational carbon, you wanna make sure that your design is sufficient from the start. So that's where we start looking at the big picture and having uh, the overall design and structure. From there, we're looking at how we can use less materials. Um, and then from what materials we do need to have, what are our options that we can use to do to select lower carbon impact materials. Other things that we're considering while we're doing this are like, are they repairable? How can you replace materials? Um, you know, uh, a metal panel might have a 20 year life cycle versus a brick, which is gonna have a much longer life cycle. So how many times does that metal panel then have to be replaced to be comparable? Um, and then obviously there's going to be materials and embodied carbon in the building. So then the last step there is question and offsets. Um, so how does Tally fit into this picture? Well, Tally does two different types of studies, um, kind of similar to how uh, Jacob mentioned Athena will do comparisons with a baseline, but with also without a baseline. Um, Tally will do comparisons for design options, and then it'll do a whole building LCA. So when you're looking at different designs for structures, you might model up a, a structural bay and compare it to another structural bay design to see how the two compare. Um, uh, the way that the whole building baseline works is you would set a baseline earlier and then as you're designing and switching out materials for lower carbon, your then proposed design would show your reduction. So how we integrate Tally into our design process involves a little, it's, I'm just gonna back up a little bit, one second, sorry. Tally is a plugin to Revit. Um, it's not a standalone program like Athena is. So uh, it's not free either. Tally requires a license. It was uh, developed by Kieran Timberlake and Autodesk and Think Tank, a uh, group of people that run this uh, plugin to Revit. And it, similarly to Athena, has a database of EPDs that it accesses. Um, and what it does is it reads your Revit model and it does the quantity takeoffs for you. And you uh, apply a tally EPD material, like a tally material with an EPD in the database to your Revit material. And then it will look at how much of that Revit material is in the model and calculate the life cycle for you, the embodied carbon. Um, so it sounds like it's just running an add-on to Revit, right? But it's a little more than that because you've got to really think about what you're trying to study and what you're trying to identify here. Um, and so the first thing you have to identify is what it is that you're trying to study here. And make sure that you've got those assemblies modeled correctly, you've got materials applied to them correctly so that uh, the uh, tally plugin will be able to quanti uh, quantify the material correctly. 
Um, so some other things that you want to consider when you're doing this process is uh, if you're working with consultants, uh, if who's running the linked model, who's doing the material input, um, if there's changes and updates, who's maintaining that. These are just things that you want to consider during the process. And then as Jacob had also mentioned, you might not be studying every single component in the building. Are you going to be studying finishes? And so the use of work sets can be really helpful in differentiating what you want to include in your study and what you don't want to include. For example, if you don't want to include any of those non-structural interior partitions, you can just put them on an interior work set that you can exclude from the study. And it'll read everything else in your model. Um, so this is where Revit best practice models or Revit modeling best practices will help you with your embodied carbon analysis. So after you've determined what you want to study, make sure that your, what you're studying in terms of your design options are like similar, same functional unit. Um, you made sure that your model is correct and everything's modeled there well and your materials are assigned. You'll actually run the tally report and then you'll think, great, I have all my answers. <laughs> Um, but then you need to actually check the report. So the report comes with a list of quantities in the back, and that's where you want to go through and make sure that everything was quantified correctly and do a quality analysis on it. And really, tally is just giving you data. So then you've got to apply that results to your design and think about your decision making. So um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a brief study of how Aerostreet has used tally and integrated this into her design process. So we started with um, some independent you know, analysis and testing, building up some internal capacity. Um, and I can show you uh, a project that we did for our, um, how we compare our standard exterior assemblies. From there, we moved into you know, leveraging client interest in materials, uh, for example, CLT. If a client's interested in CLT for another reason, we might bring up embodied carbon as additional backup, and then that will really springport the conversation forward. Um, uh, after uh, that, we've also had projects where we've been able to leverage that client interest for analyzing specific discrete portions of the design and how different um, components could be built. And moving forward, we once we started building up that internal capacity, running some of that lead uh, points for just having an LCA, we were able to then move into moving, uh, running LCAs with the baseline so that we could get the additional lead points and optimizing the materials for reductions. And this has really led into some lessons learned about how we iterate with consultant contracts and things like that. So that's where we're moving forward is looping back into that research and how um, we can make our contracts and work things work better moving forward. So this is just an example of some of the projects that we did to build up capacity internally, where we analyzed our exterior, our standard exterior assemblies. You know, we have a standard six inch backup, so we're assuming the same structural system and then just changing the rain screen facade to understand how these different facades or these different wall assemblies compare to each other. But we've also wanted to kind of identify these things in terms of life cycle and the intent of the building. What is the, de what is the design intent of the building? Because we have um, school projects in our office, which are obviously intended for a 50 plus lifespan. And then we also have, um, you know, tenant projects or interior fit out, which might have a, sh more sh a shorter lifespan and a faster turnover. So you might consider something with lower embodied carbon gets less durable because it's not expected to be around as long. So we just wanted to highlight for our designers just different ways that you can think about the life cycle of the building. So this is just an example of what we actually get out of the tally report. Um, this graph is useful, but really think about tally as the data and how you are applying that data. So we end up making our own graphs most of the time and our own graphics um, and just using the data out of the tally. So this is an example 
um, of how we took this sheet out of Tally and made it something a little more user friendly. Um, applying, you know, how this shows how each component of this brick wall assembly um, is contributing to the embodied carbon. So as I noted earlier, um, each one of these walls has the same backup. So that's um, this line here you can see is just, this is the amount that you have to include for the backup. And then this is the uh, added for the terrain screen. That's the actual comparison piece here. And you can see how much of this for this brick wall is part of the cladding materials versus the attachment and metals. And similarly, what Jacob was saying, that just tells you that if you're trying to reduce the embodied carbon in this wall, the cladding material, the brick itself, is where you're going to focus. So this is showing the backup wall and how each of the different wall types has a different area that you might focus on. Um, EFIS, for example, a lot of the embodied carbon is actually from the insulation and not the club. Um, so this is another way of looking at it. These, these, this graph here is breaking it all up down by the component of the wall assembly. But if you wanted to look at it in another way, um, this graph breaks up all of the information by what part of the life cycle is contributing the most. So for most of these, you can see the orange is the product. The actual making and manufacturing of the product is what's contributing the vast majority of the embodied carbon. However, with EFIS, you can see that there's a large chunk for maintenance and replacement. This has got to do with life cycle um, and the fact that it needs to be replaced twice within the 60 year life cycle where the other midget wall materials only have to be replaced once. The green part at the bottom is the module D recovery, and that's the recycling piece that Jacob was mentioning is not included in the lead credit. Um, but it's another way that you can look at the material. So, you know, steel uh, or metal panel has a bigger recycling credit than veneer, and that may or may not influence how you see these two members. So this last example here is just a case study of how we have done this for a whole building LCI. This is our Acton Boxborough Regional School District. Um, this is actually two um, K through six schools and preschool all combined into one new building. Um, and we were able to achieve a 28% reduction through supplementary cementous materials in the slabs and foundations. Um, we also reduced some of the XPS, and then they also had carbon cure CMU in this project. Um, and so that is the end of my slides. So I guess I will open up the chat and see what questions there are. Hi, uh, I can read the, the first question that came in is how does the program um, quant quantify materials in Athena. Uh, do you do the math yourself for say numbers of columns or do you enter in the grid, et cetera? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I didn't, I didn't dive uh, into that, but we calculate the material uh, quantities ourselves, uh, which is, you know, why uh, uh, something like Athena is free is because, you know, it, it, requires a lot of work on our end in order to get those material uh, takeoffs um, ourselves. So we, we usually we, we get those uh, from the drawings that are provided by um, the team. Um, so we do enter in like the number of columns uh, rather than the grid. Um, and then Athena um, sort of has assumptions uh, based on sort of uh, say for columns, you know, what, what your floor um, dimensions are. Um, and how far apart you know, your columns are going to be. Um, and then Athena will make an assumption as to, um, you know, all the little bits and pieces that go with obviously a floor, a floor assembly and, and, and column beam assemblies um, and just put that, put that all together for you. Um, and again, you know, this isn't super accurate, but it's a pretty good representation. Um, 
whereas you know something like tally will give me a bit more uh, of an accurate representation uh, but again you know this is a free software so uh, you know you get you sort, of, you sort of get what you get and adam i you know the similar question could be applied to tally you know do you you you, you mentioned you do a lot of case by case you know by material or assembly but do you do uh uh, full by a uh, full building assembly calculations as well. Yeah, so you can do a whole building LCA, but um, you're you're literally going to go in and apply a tally material to every single rubber material. Um, so then, moving on to the next question, and uh, Mary, I, I didn't I didn't didn't see the the, the group with this, but Mary. Uh, works with me and she is pitting Autumn and Jacob against each other here. She says, does it make sense for LCAs to be done in-house by architecture firms or are they more specialized and need to be done by TGE or other sustainability consultants? So Autumn, Jacob, debate. Oh boy. <laughs> um, I guess I, I could start. I, I, I guess would counter that and say, you know, it's best to sort of do an integrative uh, process, you know, with the project team. So you want to include everybody as a part of it. And the sustainability consultants, you know, their job is to provide sustainable, uh, you know, options to, to your building. And you know, that's what we specialize in. But I do understand the question of, you know, if it has to do with the design of the building and picking and choosing materials, that is exactly what the architect um, is doing. And there are, you know, other LCA tools um, that are out there that sort of bridge that gap between, you know, how can we work with the architect to help them select the tools or help them select the, the materials and products that are out there um, that will help you, you know, reduce uh, the carbon, uh, the embodied carbon of your building. So. Yeah, I think it, it does it, uh, sort of depend on on what approach and what tool you, you think you're gonna use. Um, I would say if you're going to do things in house, staffing is important. Um, you know, you could have somebody that you know just does all of the tally, you know, work and knows knows how to do the program. It's it's not hard to learn, but um, but then it could you know you, you get questions about oh, what's exactly spec, what is exactly the design intent. Um, so I do think it is important that the project team is involved no matter whether you know the, the actual analysis is being done in house or out of house. That's excellent answers. Um, just a couple more questions before we move on to our next presentation. Uh, do you like Athena better than EC3? Um, so I guess they they sort of do the same things and one lacks you know different um, tools over the other, whereas, you know, Athena makes a lot of assumptions and you're sort of stuck with the um, EPD database uh, that uh, Athena provides you with and the EC3 tool, um, you know, you can create projects uh, or buildings within the EC3 tool um, and you can also select um, EPDs, um, but it doesn't spit out sort of the same um, reports that Athena can, can, I guess, can spit out for you. Um, in terms of uh, lead documentation, um, but they can be used sort of in conjunction with each other, right? One has a, a larger EPD database. You can certainly use uh, EC3 and compare uh, different different materials. Um, but uh, I think EC3 is definitely a, a great tool to be used um, in terms of you know. I think at, at least for architects, you know, you can go in and choose uh, different materials or different products and. Sort of compare and contrast, and if I know that my steel beams have a lot of embodied carbon, how can I choose a different steel beam that reduces that? Um, and EC3 can absolutely show you that uh, level of detail, whereas Athena cannot. So it falls to both. I think that's a. I I, I mean, I've never used Athena or EC3 personally, um, but I think it's a great point that each tool has its own pros and cons. So when uh, when making this comparison, do they have the same R value? Um, I think that would be in tally. 
Um, yes. So I think that this is talking to the slide and it's actually a really great point that I didn't touch on very well. Um, so yes, they need to be the same R value if you're talking about comparing a wall to a wall. Um, so that's where the functional unit comes into play. When you're doing comparison studies, you need to make sure that what you're comparing is apples to apples. So if it's a wall assembly, that means the same thermal performance. If it's a structural bay, that means it's, it's holding the same program and doing the same function. Um, so that is a really important point that you need to make sure that what you're comparing is equivalent because if you compare a wall with a lower R value to a wall with a higher R value, you're, you don't have the same um, operational effect. And so you're not able to really compare the uh, equivalent emissions in totality, if that makes sense. Oh. Uh, one more, and then we'll move on to quanting. Uh, how can contractors become more involved in the LCA discussion? Any thoughts? My first thought goes to concrete mixes. This, is, this has been a huge conversation from my understanding is, is getting coordination between the structural engineers and the, you know, what's, what's locally available in terms of concrete replacement. I don't know if Jacob has anything different. Yeah, I think I think that's about it. You know, part of the embodied carbon, you know, I guess life cycle assessment is, you know, actual construction and you know, transporting that product to the to the site, but the contractor doesn't really have too much control, you know, over over that embodied carbon is sort of just stuck with where the building is um, placed. So like you said, you know, um, selection of different concrete mixes that, that we're able to uh, reduce. If this was like a you know a, a project that uh, where you had a, like a CM at risk on board early or something, you know discussions about constructability and what's most efficient could also be helpful. Yeah, but even then, it's it, I guess it's hard to you know incorporate you know what's efficient into your life cycle assessment because it's a lot of these a lot of these tools that we have are they use all these preloaded EPDs. Um, to have all this data already in place and then they make assumptions based on where your project is and um, how that contributes to the embodied carbon of that particular material. So it's 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 difficult, but definitely definitely a good question and something to, to uh, think about and hopefully answer. All great questions and everyone keep thinking more. We'll have a chance to answer a few other, you know, a few more questions, but let's let Quenting uh, talk with us uh, now about his uh, departure from the LCA world and take us into more energy uh, design tools. Are you muted, Quanting? <laughs> You're muted. It's still muted. Okay, great. Right now, can everyone hear, hear me? <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> yeah, so. Again, hi everyone. I'm Quanting. I'm from Alcas Manfredi Assess. I'm a sustainability analyst. <laughs> and today I'm going to introduce uh, uh, two uh, plugins for Grasshopper, and, and they are also free. It's Ladybug and Honeybee. So um, the two tools actually require, and um, it's a plugin for Grasshopper. So in order to run it, you will have to use um, Rhino. You will have to have basic knowledge for Rhino and Grasshopper, as well as install Rhino installed in your um, station. And um, it's a very powerful tool. If it's a tool for simulation and also um, visualizing climate data and for studies. So in this presentation, I will only provide a brief introduction um for for the tools 
but also um, showing some examples how we how we use these tools with our project and how it uh, provides um, directions for our decision making. So I list some pros, pros and cons for this um, for this software. Uh, so to start up, it's a free access um, source, so everyone can use it. Just download it from Food to Rhino, and you're ready to go. And since it's a free tool, the community is quite large, so you will find a lot a lot of free um, resources or tutorials online, and with a very helpful community that is always um, always willing to help. And it also could be used with other plugins in Grasshopper. So for people who don't know, Rhino is actually a modeling tool, a 3D modeling tool. And with Grasshopper, you can build a very powerful parametric design or data-driven design with those tools. And since Ladybug and Honeybee is a plugin in Grasshopper, you can combine multiple different plugins to, to actually generate um, different function different functions or different geometries that fall to your desire. Yeah. And as I mentioned, it's a visual, visualiz visualization tool as well. So combined with Rhino, the 3D model you build, you can have a wide range of uh, freedom of building the visualization. I will show you some project that we've done later on. And it's flexible across different stage of design. So it could have a large scale like um, surface radiation studies to much more detailed like um, thermal studies with with different sections how you want to build your sections what materials you are pick selecting for your project this is all helpful with both of these tools and it's built on top of several validated simulation engines so it's it provides quite reliable simulation results however However, you need some like um, experience or knowledge in the input that you set in order to get a much more accurate results. And it's it's not like random engine people build in house, so it's quite um, it's quite good. And as for cons, um, this is the same problem that we have in our firm, Alcus and Freddy. So we use most of our uh, uh, people use teams use uh, Revit and SketchUp for building, building process or design process. And if that's the case, you, you might require to um, have an additional step to actually import those models into Rhino in order to run uh, Ladybug and Honeybee, um, which is um, might have some errors here and there. But yeah, this is a, a problem that we face um, a lot of times. And secondly, it requires, of course, it requires knowledge for Rhino and Grasshopper in order to use them. And the last two is compatibility and um, debugging and installation. Since it's a free, free, it's a free tool, sometimes you will, you will find um, conflict between versions that you have to debug or find, try to find the, the errors that the, why the simulation doesn't work as you want it to work. So you have to figure it out yourself. But just that, as I mentioned, it has a big community. So there's always helpful resource online and answers that you can find. So begin with Ladybug. So Ladybug could visualize the weather, weather data, um, the weather data into graphics to much more friend, user-friendly graphics for clients and design teams to understand. And I would, this is the um, site where Ladybug will actually get you to, so you can download the weather data on on the location that is close as cl the closest to your project. So yeah, and Ladybug actually transform the data into visual visualizing it into a much um, user friendly interface. So in this case, I, I just pulled out the dry bulb temperature and wind speed and humidity to actually um, demonstrate how it actually um, shows when you are putting all the data and in a single, single figure. And with that in mind, we are able to start up with um, understanding the 
um, weather data and also generates this psychrometric chart to understand what kind of passive strategies we should we could um, we could do for for our for our project. So yeah, as you can see, different strategies have, might have different results in in our studies. So we are using this to actually um, communicate with our design teams and figure out the best options for each of our projects. And this is the wind study also made by Ladybug. So th in this case, we are able to use this to actually try to understand what geometry we are going to shape our building mass in order to avoid wind tunnel effect on our open outdoor open area. Of course, much more like detail, detailed wind simulation requires powerful CFD tools to run it, but but this is a very good like starting point for us to start with the design. And this is much more of a visualization for clients or or design teams that is not so familiar with um, with um, data. So yeah, so basically we want to pull out the data that is um, critical or we are interested in. So in this case, we are we use the mapping on the uh, lower left hand side to under to try to pick out the timing that we are interested in. For example, the extreme extremely hot um, uh, time time period in in the full year and try to see what where the sun is actually located during those period of time. So yeah is sort of like a demonstrate how we use those files. And this is the surface radiation studies. So the project on the left is actually, we use it to determine the orientation of the window and how we want to place the fins to in order to reduce the overall solar heat gain of this um, tower. And on the right-hand side, we are actually using this to understand the impact of our large outdoor shading. So we sort we compare different shading options. And with, with this tool, we are actually able to tell which shading option could actually block more uh, solar radiation from the surface. And this is much more typical um, shadow study also done by uh, Ladybug. So it, it, helps us study the impact that this project has on the surrounding urban context. And as we jump into Honeybee, Honeybee is much more complicated compare, comparing to Ladybug. And it's often known as doing energy, energy simulation rather than doing daylighting and um, thermal studies. But, but in this case, it's a free tool and it provides those functions and it runs on a um, pretty good engine, so why not? <laughs> yeah, so, so both of these uh, for Ladybug and Honeybee, both of them are written in Python. So if for advanced users or people who know some, like have some experience in coding or computation, computational design, you are able to uh, sp sp specify the data that you required and actually run a much more sp specific uh, simulation for your study. And this is the solar daylight autonomy study. Um, it's it's a harder it's harder to model, actually, and it actually takes longer to for simulation. So we often use it to as for smaller areas rather than the full building simulation, and we always set to lower quality in this case before run, running the final simulation. And for people who don't know what SDA is, it's a percentage of time when the area exceeds the brightness level. For example, on the left-hand side is, is three, 300 lux, which is pretty typical for lead and well points. So we also use, use this for achieving lead points as well. But of course, just like I mentioned, it requires um, a, Pr uh, proper setup for running simulation before um, the documenting. 
And we, are, we also use this to check for uh, glaring potential. So maybe some part of the building that exceed uh, 1000 to like 1500 lux, um, like 50% of the time, that is the area that we are much more focused on. So we can develop like, or change the orientation or change the position of the glazing or shading study for, for the option. Like in this case, um, in this case, uh, the client have a thermal stress problem on the southeast corner, the, the space we highlighted red. So, which means it have too much direct sunlight. So we actually use this um, direct sunlight hour study for different options to get a faster result instead of run, running the SDA. And as you can see, we tried out multiple different shading options to actually uh, figure out the perfect balance of lighting and direct sunlight. Of course, all of these tools shouldn't be run alone. It should be like back and forth. So, so a lot of, so different uh, simulations should compare with each other like simultaneously. So we can actually find a perfect balance, but not just trying to achieve a, a single um, goal. Yeah, this is um, also um, clear study, but in this case for larger project, we usually typically use a shoebox method to actually pick certain um, typical uh, space on each facade or each different orientation to actually give a faster results for us to understand how, how we want to um, ap approach our design. And as you can see, um, there's also mapping, mapping method that is combined with the ladybug function. So you can actually map out what period throughout the year that the room have too much heat load. So it's an example of, of um, combination of different plugins. Yeah, last but not least, the glare studies. So, so this is more of a presenting as well. So in this case, we have the fisheye view for um, an auditorium space, a large auditorium space. So fisheye view allows us to, uh, to have a much more like interior perspective of how the lights will reflect or how it will impact the ceiling area and the floor horizontal spaces and also the walls as well. So this is our different method that we can present um, the glaring issue as well. And I think this is the last one. So, so honeybee is, norm, is normally known as doing energy model as well, but we are not like, we are not like professional energy modeler. <laughs> so in this, I will always suggest people in our firm to use Honeybee as a comparison tool instead of a tool that is getting the correct results. So in this case, we are we are using it early early stage. Oh, this is the same one that I mentioned with the shading. So different different depth of the shading. We are trying to compare how the energy will will actually will will perform differently with the shading. So it could it provide some. Um, early stage um, knowledge for us to actually um, understand more about what, what we are doing, when, what impact we are making for our, model, for our design. Yeah, and I think that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, um, we had a couple, that was, that was great, thank you so much. Um, we had a couple questions. The first one is, um, oh, sorry, yeah. okay. the, um, the debugging work seems massive. Do you need to be full time to work on this? Um, maybe I should read the question. <laughs> the debugging work seems, oh, do, do, yeah. Do you need to be working full time to, um, to work with this program? Uh, um, I think that the, so, what we usually do is we actually rebuild most of the model so we don't have to deal with the debugging. Sometimes you, it, yeah. 
do you personally work on this full time? Yes, yes, but oh. I'm 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 more more <coughs> like my character in the firm is much more of a um trying to coach or guide um design teams to use this tool. So so most of my time is is doing um. Um, coaching and also developing script for them to use so they don't have to actually learn grasshopper they just need to know where they should input the, the, the geometry they build and in order to get a quick results yeah. so what would you say um for someone who's not in your position who's specific to sustainability what would you say um like the the project team's involvement in um you know, Ladybug and Honeybee is? Do they come to you and say, hey, can you change this? Can you provide data on this? Or do they ever do any of the modeling themselves? Um, I'll say both. Because <laughs> sometimes it, dep it actually depends because always the design, the schedule for each project are always so, so short. So we always encourage teams to approach us earlier at the earlier stage in design and we can guide them to do the simulation and after and sometimes a lot of team a lot of our colleagues actually after they learn this tool they actually are able to do like quick study like shadow study radiation study by themselves instead of always come to me to get to get um, advice or even ask me to run the simulation for them okay, great so they're also using this yes Right, that's that's really helpful to know. Um, and then Autumn asked, uh, how do you think Honeybee's day laying tool compares to Sephira? And I'm sorry, Autumn, is that how you pronounce that program? So I'm not familiar with Sephira. So before we, I usually, what I usually use is um, Diva and, and even the latest um, Climate Studio. I, I use both of them, but um, I mean, it's a, it's a free it's a free tool so so it's Sephira is free as well which is why oh, I was wondering okay <laughs> great <laughs> yeah so I think I don't know about Sephira but for Honeybee I think if you are doing daylight daylight team study for example solar autonomy that I mentioned in my presentation it will be much more tricky to model the geometry yeah so so <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you that's you're muted uh, everyone please feel free to turn on your microphones and jump in if you have a question um i have a question and this is um honestly for all three of you but i'd love to hear how your the data that you're collecting you know what what phase of the design process do you use this the most um and how how does this data change between between phases maybe i should start <laughs> yeah so um my tool the tool i'm introducing ladybug and honeybee are usually used at very early stage just maybe like design development or sd not like that is the the phase that we can have the best impact on on the project because so yeah so for for us we do it very pretty early um for tally it it is you can do studies early design studies for um schematic design like i mentioned where you or basically modeling up sections of your building for design options. Um, but most of the time, I mean, we do, we do that, but let's separate Revit studies. Um, then at SD, we'll set a baseline. And then at the end of construction, we'll do the like, actual proposed design for the, the um, lead credit. Yeah, I think it, I can I can agree with that. I mean, ideally, it's used early on. Um, obviously, the earlier you you run a model, the earlier you can make decisions. Um, 
and the, you know, usually the more um, embodied carbon you can you can reduce towards the end. But what we usually see, um, and what we are trying to work against, is you know we see projects just trying to you know conduct a life cycle assessment of the of the design that they have, and they just sort of end up waiting um, until CDs. Um, so it's 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 a decision. And again, this is why these presentations are important on embodied carbon. You know, if, if that's something that we think about early on, just like we think about operational costs as early as possible, um, then these types of models can be run early and embodied carbon can be reduced uh, much easier uh, than uh, what we're doing right now. So. And then we have another question in the chat. Uh, do you often use any of the tools discussed in an effort to, in an effort to win projects? If so, you share what this resource allocation, what the resource allocation for this entails. So I think what we're talking about here is um, from a business perspective, you know. Right. So, I mean, I don't think any of us are part of marketing, um, <laughs> but I. I can say I, sh I shared one uh, graphic where it talked about like Arrow Street's path to net zero carbon. And like that's the kind of graphic where we might include into an interview for a job where we're talking about embodied carbon at a high level, but we're not necessarily like using tally to win a job. Yeah, I agree with Adam. I think that's that's too early to be able to use the tool effectively. We could it, it it could be something that we offer just as a you know uh, something that we can right as a discussion on like a services right. related to embodied carbon. Right, but it's yeah, it's never like you know we based on you know this project we can expect to reduce embodied carbon by this much. You know it it's it's not possible until you know I think we're drawings have been, have been made basically. So it's, um, but it's definitely something interesting to think about for sure. Yeah, awesome. same, same, oh. same goes with us. So yeah, we are not market marketing people, but also it also depends on the um, pro project manager to see if, if they are interested to include those in marketing. So do you ever, um, you know, Create something that may be maybe used in an RFP. Like, does marketing ever come to you and say, like, can you create a, um, you know, this simple box model or something we're gonna use, or can you provide like a graph, like kind of that you presented today, um, so we can you use that for an RFP? Uh, I I never um, have this case, but. It's all. It's always an option for for the tool that I introduce. But yeah, Athena, with Athena, it's not it's not possible. Um, just because you you do need the, uh, <laughs> to, you know, at bare minimum, <laughs> the the takeoffs from the building. But there are other LCA softwares out there where you can sort of create a, you know, what I guess in, in the LCA world, a, a box model that you can base it off of. But again, you know. That kind of information that you get out of it sort of has to be taken with a grain of salt until you get like the actual drawings. Yeah, I could I could imagine like a case study type thing, but sure. Yeah, you can not compare anything like, like project it specific school, compared to another school or something like that along the same size. Awesome. Um, I also just wanted to mention that um, Lara has pasted in the chat, and so have I the link to um, put your name in to receive a credits. So if you are looking to receive those, please click on that and fill out the Google form. And then we have another question in the chat. Um, you said, I used to spend some time to learn Ladybug and Honeybee from some YouTube channels, but the learning curve was big, daunting. Do you have, oh, daunting. Do you have um, any recommended learning resource or classes to uh from yeah so i also start from youtube channel <laughs> i use i usually uh watch tutorial videos when i was still in school uh, from chris mackey who who is the developer of the ladybug <coughs> tool 
and it's quite useful. And of course, if you want to be a much more advanced uh, users, you have to understand um, Grasshopper and and about the data it's running through the whole pro progress in order to um, select or actually uh, pick out the stuff that you need to run the simulation. But I think for Ladybug or some shadow studies, those kind of stuff is quite simple. But for energy modeling and and much dive deeper um, and um, solar studies might require um, much more knowledge. But as I mentioned, the, there's a lot of resource online. You can always find someone who is willing to help. And this is kind of for all of you. So Quentin, you're saying that you started with um, YouTube videos. Autumn and Jacob, what about you? How did you guys teach yourself these programs? Sure, so um, Karen Timberlake has some tutorials on choosetally.com, which is where you go to download Tally. Um, not tally.com, choosetally.com. Um, and let's see here, I also emailed their help a lot. <laughs> they respond. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I, 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 I think it was really just mostly the resources on Choose Tally. It's, it's really pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, someone in house taught me most of Athena, and then a lot of it's sort of intuitive. Of you know, you just sort of click around. There's not like a lot, um, <laughs> a lot to click on uh, in Athena. Uh, it's one of the more simpler ones. I think it's free, but um, yeah, someone in house. Um, at our at our firm, uh, gave me a, a tutorial, and um, you know, once you do your takeoffs and uh, start creating a model, it just sort of seems to flow together. And then you know, you you the tutorials that they offer online um, through you know that, that the software that Athena offers online um, help explain a lot of the assumptions that they make um, in the model. Um, and I and I use that from time to time, um, but they also offer a lot of it you know, um, explanations uh, in the software itself, if you have any questions. Um, I would say like the biggest learning curve on LCI softwares in general is probably understanding the, con the conceptual ideas of like the boundary condition and the functional unit. Like that kind of like terminology and understanding like the assumptions and what goes into it is, is really the biggest learning curve, not the software. Yeah, I'd say most most LCA software is pretty intuitive. It's how do you how are, how are we selecting the materials correctly? Um, you know, so well, if there aren't any other questions, which if there are, feel free to unmute or to throw them in the chat really quick. Um, but if not, I think we're getting pretty close to time. So I just want to thank all three of you. This has been incredibly informative and I just want to say how impressive it is, this work that you're doing. Um, so thank you so much. Um, also, just one more reminder, I'm going to paste the link in the chat for AI credits one more time. So please do not forget to go fill that out. Um, and also, I wanted to remind everyone of our um, next month's event with over um, environmental equality the mass group we're looking forward to that and that should be up on the calendar tomorrow so um february 16th 5 p.m yes and, and 5 p.m is we usually do 6 p.m so it's a little bit different this time so um just you know mental note but i think we're gonna be a really good presentation so and and thank you all. Um, thanks to the audience for the good questions, and thank you uh, to our three presenters. Great job, and really, really appreciate it. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Have a nice evening, everyone. Bye. Thank you.